My name is Scott Nye, and this is Talking Radical Radio. Hello and welcome to Talking Radical Radio, where we bring you grassroots voices from across Canada. We give you the chance to hear many different people who are facing many different struggles talk about what they're doing, how they're doing it, and why they're doing it, in the belief that such listening is a crucial step in strengthening all of our efforts to change the world. On this week's show, I'll be speaking with Joyce Fasella and Val Joseph. Gendered violence is everywhere in mainstream settler society in Canada. It is mostly committed by men, and it mostly targets women and trans people, not exclusively, but mostly, and it is mostly committed not by strangers, but by somebody you know, somebody in your family, a romantic partner, a co-worker, a friend. Back before colonization, gender, kinship, and relationships, like so much else, worked very differently across the many indigenous nations of Turtle Island. But five centuries of colonial violence against indigenous people, which has been tied all along to imposing gendered and sexual violence, have made a deep impact. Even just within the last century, violence imposed by the Canadian state in the form of residential schools, the 60s scoop as well as more recent harm to indigenous families from child welfare systems, forced disconnection from language, land, nation, and culture, and the everyday harms of racism have all done incredible damage. These days, gendered violence is a significant issue in indigenous communities, just like it is everywhere else in the country. And in indigenous communities, it can frequently be linked to life histories and family histories of colonial trauma. This distinct history and context, as well as the deep roots of indigenous cultures that continue to survive in the face of colonization, mean that working to change gendered violence in indigenous contexts is most effective when it is firmly grounded in this history in a holistic approach to the problem, and in the relevant indigenous cultures. The Warriors Against Violence Society is an organization based in Vancouver that tries to do exactly that. Originally, the organization worked exclusively with men who had engaged in violent and abusive behavior. Today, however, they work with both men and women, with perpetrators and survivors, and of course with the many people who are both. Their program offers participants a wide range of tools for navigating their lives. It offers a safe space for people to talk about their experiences of harm and trauma, and a place to begin coming to terms with the harms that they themselves have caused. And it does all of this using a holistic, indigenous approach. Sessions might include learning about tools like journaling or identification of triggers. They might involve conversations about sexuality or family. They might include gathering medicines, introducing elements of traditional culture, or discussing spirituality. The organization says of its work, quote, We believe there is a need to restore the traditional Aboriginal values of honor, respect, and equality. The circle of life includes elders, life givers, men, and youth. All have a right to live in nonviolent families and communities, end quote. Joyce Fasella is from the Lillooet Nation. She's worked as part of the Warriors Against Violence Society for 20 years and is currently its executive director. And Val Joseph is from the Kwakwakewak Nation, and she's been a facilitator with the Warriors Against Violence Society for five years. They speak with me about their own experiences, about the connections between interpersonal gendered violence and legacies of colonial violence, and about the work of the Warriors Against Violence Society. My name is Joyce Fasella. I come from the Lewat Nation, and that is just about 30 minutes north of Whistler in BC. I come from a family of 11 children, and my mother comes from Lillooet, BC. My dad comes from Mount Curry. The organization that I work for is Warriors Against Violence Society. I've been with them for 20 years now. I started out as a facilitator and now the executive director. My name is Val Joseph, and I am Kwakwakiwak from Kingcom Inlet on the west coast of BC. I was a participant of Warriors many years ago, and am now a facilitator and have been for five years. For myself, it wasn't really my career path to begin with. I worked mainly in employment and education. And into our 25th year of marriage, my husband and I, 
We just about broke up due to violence and abuse in our relationship. I decided to get some help for myself and did so. But in the 25th year of marriage, I had found out something about my husband that was very hurtful. And I was tired physically, emotionally, psychologically, all of those. And I just said, that's it. I don't want to take any more abuse. I waited for him to come home from work that one day. And I just said, I just heard something about you today. And I don't know how many more secrets you have. But unless you get some help and make some change in your life, we're finished. Unfortunately, he did take that to heart, and he found an organization called Change of Seasons Program, and it was a program for assault of men and begin to make change, and I, I recognized that. He was working on himself and growing and making change. The facilitators of that organization noticed that he was earnest, that he did make change, and that he was taking accountability. And they said, you'd make a good counselor. You should take some training. They kept on him. And then one day they just said, you go get some counseling skills and we'll hire you. He went to school, got certified to become one of the facilitators and start working with them. But as many organizations shut down, he and another person were the last hired, so the first to go. At that point, they decided they would try to organize a program for men in Vancouver because they were meeting across the waters at at North Vancouver. And that's how they started. They were able to get a few dollars to start. We are located at the Kowasa Neighborhood House in Vancouver, who were very, very gracious to let them come in and use the facility. How I got involved is that the men participants of that program that they started began to say, well, my partner, my spouse, my wife wants to know, when are we going to have one for the women? Because it was just a men's program. They eventually decided to open it up to women, which is very controversial because here's two men working with women and kind of bringing the perpetrator and the victims together and very controversial in society as far as that goes, especially in counseling organizations. They tried it, but decided they needed women. And so they just asked myself and the late Daniel Parker's wife to come in and facilitate the women's group. And I said, well, I can do that. I know what it is to be victimized and I can help the women and found out into the third session that the women weren't always the abused in that relationship and they were there to get help for themselves because they felt they were violent and abusive themselves. And that was a eye opener for me because I, I just assumed with my own stereotypical view that it was just men who were the abusers. So we begin to open it up to women now today. The women get the same message men get. And I understand that most everyone has been victimized at one point. So they get to the point where that they don't want to be victimized again. So they protect themselves. And many times it is in an abusive way. So this is how I got started. And this is why I do that work today, because I understand that, you know, I needed help. My husband needed help. Men are 90%, though, responsible for violence against women. And I really believe that there needs to be more help out there for men so that women are in more of a safe place. My story is a little bit different. I started off as a hairdresser for 17 years. And in doing so, I had neck and back and leg issues from the standing long hours and stuff. And so I couldn't do that work any longer. And people told me over and over that I'd make a good counselor. My clients in the hairdressing industry would follow me from one suburb to the next just to get their hair cut. And so when I couldn't do that work any longer, I decided to go into counseling school, which fit because my father was a residential school child and the trauma that he experienced there was with him right until his last days. And so with that came a lot of anger and violence and hatred for any sort of person in authority. So it was a scary time for us as children and even teens, but also witnessing a lot of violence in the community of other couples. So when I went into counseling, I thought, well, first of all, I'm going to help my family. And then realizing in the course that I have to help myself first before I can help anybody else. And so I started doing a lot of work on myself, and my relationship also had some violence in it, and I had children. 
So we both went to Warriors Against Violence to get that help. And the skills we learned there were extremely helpful. We had many good years without violence and without alcohol. Our children were well taken care of. We went back to school and took other courses. And then there came an opportunity for a facilitator training at Warriors Against Violence. And I took that because I knew that it worked. And it wasn't until years later I ran into Joe and Joyce and they asked what I'd been doing. And I told them I was a counselor and I'm doing this and that. And they asked if I would be interested in working with Warriors Against Violence. And the opportunity, of course, I didn't have to think about it. It's an awesome opportunity. So I've been with Warriors for five years now. It's extremely rewarding work because we can see the change in people's lives. So it's very rewarding work. Of course, sometimes it's hard, but the rewards are more than the hardships. Tell me about the Warriors Against Violence Society's program. When the individuals begin to talk about their own pain and trauma, they begin to open up. They shed a lot of tears, and it's difficult sometimes for them. But once they begin to do that, they get to release some of that pain and begin to get the support from the others. And they get to realize where their anger has come from. And a lot of times it comes from trauma from their childhood. And that's what we're hearing a lot of, either witnessing the violence And there's some horrendous stories that come from the participants and their own experiences. And I guess in what we see is that they begin to protect themselves by being the abuser. Maybe they've learned that through watching and witnessing the violence and growing up and not wanting to be victimized in that way. So they begin to do that to their loved ones usually. And we provide a safe environment for them. It's very confidential. My husband usually lets them know once they've shed their stories and told about their trauma, and he asks them, well, how did you feel as that little child? And they could explain at that point, you know, the fears, the hurt and the pain and those sorts of things. And my husband says, well, now maybe you understand you're a victim at this point because you're putting that victim through the same experiences that you've gone through. And it just sort of opens their eyes to see like, wow, they didn't realize that that's what they were doing. I find that understanding where their anger comes from to begin with, and then we provide those tools like, you know, it sounds simple in that, but it takes work even just to do a timeout. And the timeout is one of the first tools that we provide for them. Just by taking that timeout, they can stop violent behavior. It's very effective. We start off with a startup package that has some basic skills in there to learn. And one of them is our feelings, like how to identify our feelings and express them. That helped me a lot. And I pass that on to my children as well. Because what we hear over and over is people don't have somebody safe that they can trust. Trust is a huge issue. So they hold a lot of things in over years. And then there's an explosion and somebody gets hurt. So one of the things we start off with is identify what we're feeling and then put words to it. That in itself is sort of a release. And then practice expressing that to your partners. That's opening up the communication as well so that there isn't that built up frustration and resentment. So there's 28 sessions, 28 different topics. We also have a cultural component thrown into those 28. We introduce the smudge to a lot of people. Joe and Blair have a sweat lodge a couple of times a year. We pick the medicines in Merritt. We'll go and pick some sage um, for a day trip. And people really get connected to some of the culture and just explore that. It's not everyone's practice, but it gives them that experience to maybe want to look into some of their own culture. So that cultural piece is also huge. It really helps them to know who they are and where they're from. And that in itself instills some pride and strength. There's different things. I mean, we look at sexuality and that power imbalance when you look at that. We look at anger as it surfaces. There's usually a common theme in a couple. So paying attention to trigger words because you can't do anything about it until you know what it is. 
In the package, we give them a sheet that's a, it's a control plan. Through that control plan, they keep a journal, and when there are incidences, ask them to go over that control plan, like, what was the issue? What was the subject? And they begin to understand, wow, we always argue about, you know, his friends or her family or the chores. To recognize that when that topic comes up, it may lead to full-blown argument and may lead to violence. Understanding those triggers It's a tool for them to practice because making change in your behaviors is not easy and it does take time. And I know that we incorporate culture, but we also incorporate spirituality and and we think that's really important. Our program is very holistic. We do cover things like residential school, the 60s school, you know, about colonization and those sorts of things and how that affects our people and, and how it affects them. One of the sessions we do is, we call it the five cornerstones, but it's reasons that keep us in violence. And that is family of origin. How did you grow up? What did you witness? Who had the power in the house? Who was allowed to be angry? A lot of times family of origin could have been in your biological family, but sometimes it wasn't. It could have been in foster care. They could have been adopted out. It could have been part of that 60s scoop. It could have been residential school. And to recognize all those things in their life. So it's really about going deep into themselves and into their history to see what made them who they are today. We talk about stress and the social and cultural part of it, like what has society contributed to that as well, but recognizing that society condones anger through the media in all kinds of aspects. And culturally, many of us don't even know how to speak our language. That was taken away, and how does that make you feel? To look at that and see what effect that had on you. Facing racism basically on a daily basis. It's hard for non-Indigenous to understand how our people face racism lots of times on a daily basis, just taking the bus to work or walking down the street or, you know, walking into a store or restaurant and how you're treated. We talk about things like that and how it makes you feel. But we also provide ways of communicating in a safe way. So those are some of the things that we do. Positive communications is really something that we try to teach. So I think that a lot of white settlers and perhaps other non-Indigenous people don't necessarily fully understand the links between things that the government has done, like residential schools and the 60s scoop, and the kinds of trauma and violence that, for instance, the Warriors Against Violence Society works to address. So lay out some of those connections for listeners. When I look back at my own family and the residential schools, I grew up in Alert Bay, a small three-mile island on the coast that had a residential school until just a couple of years ago. They finally demolished it. But the things that my father talked about that happened there, that the hunger, the being locked up in a dark room with no place to sit or lay, no warmth, no light, for children to be treated like that for hours and sometimes day after day, You know, the trauma that comes with that, the mistrust, the, I believe, post-traumatic stress in probably most of them, the being taken away from your communities. My father shed many tears telling us about how he couldn't go home to my community, so he was taken to Alert Bay. But my community, you need to take a boat or a plane to go home in, and when your communities do not have employment, you can't fly your children home for spring break or for summer break. So some of them would be in there during those holidays, not seeing their families for months and months and months. And sometimes not many children were left. So that isolation and and just constantly feeling like you're being punished. So, you know, to see what my father experienced and to see it come out in his adult life is anger. And he used the word hatred so often, a hatred for government, a hatred for anybody in power and authority. Those things were very serious. And when you put alcohol into your system, that stuff comes out in those around you and most likely on the people that you love the most. The alcohol, it seems to release all of that pent-up anger from those years as children. So I grew up in a violent home. I witnessed it. I experienced it. My siblings did. My mother did. So that's what we knew. That's how we learned to handle things when it doesn't go your way. And my family still struggles with violence in the home. 
I've done my best to not bring that in for my children. I've raised four children. They're all adults now. I did not have any substance use in my home or violent men or disrespectful men. I always joke around about it, but I always say I don't want my children to have to attend Warriors. I want them to not have that experience so that they hopefully won't have to do all that healing that I went through. And I totally believe in that ripple effect of healing. And through Warriors, we get to see it happening. The stories are very similar at Warriors. Many, many, many people come through and their grandparents were in residential school, their parents. Many of them grew up in the foster care system, losing their own children. So that negative ripple effect is still also out there. Yes, and I understand that, you know, many people in society don't understand what we've gone through. And many times they just say, well, just get over it or, you know, those things. I do talk to new immigrants and refugees about colonization, about our history, about the oppression. They're very receptive to listening and hearing what we've gone through because they say, well, we didn't know that Canada had this history. They never told us anything about the Indigenous people. And lots of times what they hear about Indigenous people is very negative. So when I talk about how we could not speak our language or we could not practice our traditions or, you know, be sent to prison for it, Some can identify with that because in their own countries that they have come from, they've had to go through that so they can identify that way. Some of them just realize like, wow, I didn't know that the people of this land here had to go through that sort of oppression and control from the government. And talking about, you know, the Indian Act and the legislation, I often talk about how the governments have taken our people and taken away all their resources and lands, their vast lands and territories, and put them onto these smaller parcels of land called reserves, that sort of thing. And I said, well, what happens when, you know, your livelihood, your survival, things have been taken away from you? What do you do? And this is what has happened to many of our people throughout North America. And it helps them to understand that Our people have been oppressed, and they no longer have that freedom. I mean, even in one point in our history, they had to have a a card to travel anywhere outside their territories. These things were done to our people, right? And society doesn't really hear about those things. I know that they're starting in schools to do some of the histories and that sort of thing, and that's okay, that's good. But majority do not know and do not understand, you know, like where we've come from. So why is it important that the work of the Warriors Against Violence Society is holistic, that it has those cultural elements, those spiritual elements, and so on? It's important because that's what was taken away from us. It's who we are. It's our daily cultural practices, whether it be in dance, in song, in ceremony. No matter what we're doing, it's all connected to spiritual work. Everything we do is connected to our Creator, and that includes the land and everything, right? So I know for me, when I had that connection brought to me, so sweat lodge and smudging, which I was reminded is not my way because I'm from the west coast of BC, so that's not what we practice. To cleanse, we use the cedar boughs and have like spirit baths. We'll go into a river or a stream and cleanse that way. But all of these things were ways to take care of our wellness. So cleansing that negative energy and walking forward from that in a good way, communicating in a good way. In our longhouses here on the West Coast, there was multiple families that used to live in there. So we're very family-oriented people. And that's been taken away, you know, when they took the children away. Then we learned that family wasn't important. The government taught us that. All of our rules and laws were taken care of in the big house. Naming, marriage, grieving, those are all things that we're getting back. We had our own ways of handling those things so that they didn't take over our lives. And we're getting back to that. So Joe and Blair, who are our male facilitators, always remind people, because a lot of us come to the city looking for a better life, but it it actually doesn't offer much more. But we say, go back to your communities and learn your people's ways, because we all have a different way of practicing, but getting the same results. 
Looking again at what worked for me and my family is connecting to healthier people, people who are on the same journey. So for me, I had to look for parenting groups and recovery groups. But also I remember in the school system as a child and raising my own children, the racism that is experienced there to this day is terrible. When children have to experience that in this day and age, it's traumatizing. So, you know, us as parents are trying to do the work, and then we hear that our children are having to go through that. It's a very vicious cycle. I've raised four kids, and all of them experience that in their schools. So I think in society, it has to start with our educators, youth programs, parenting. You know, we have a different way. We believe different things, and what I find frustrating is everybody expects us to attend these programs that do not work and think the way we do, and I can't really describe how that is, except that we have a strong connection, even though it's been broken through residential schools and jails, MCFD, we still have a very strong connection to each other, and so I would hope to see more Indigenous-focused programs out there, buildings out there where there's multiple resources because we really do have a different experience than others. Yeah, dealing with these things through an Indigenous perspective, to understand that, you know, in a way, we know best how to work with each other, with our people. Way back when the government thought they knew better, well, you know, what was best for us. But in this day, we know what works for us. And just an example is Warriors Against Violence Society. We work from that holistic perspective and we incorporate culture and spirituality into the healing aspect. You have been listening to my interview with Joyce Fasella and Val Joseph of the Warriors Against Violence Society. To learn more about their work, go to wav-bc.com. That's wav-bc.com. To find out more about Talking Radical Radio, the guests, the theme music, and the ways that you can listen, or to suggest topics for future shows, go to talkingradical.ca and click on the link for the radio show. On the site, you can sign up for email updates or follow us on Facebook or Twitter. I'm your host, Scott Nye, a writer and media producer based in Hamilton, Ontario, and the author of two books of Canadian history told through the stories of activists, Gender and Sexuality, and Resisting the State, both from Fernwood Publishing. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you tune in again next week.